When I was four years old, my parents bought a farmstead in central Ontario. My dad discovered this spring bubbling out of the ground and said that this would be the place that he would build a pond. A bulldozer showed up, scooped out a big hole, and didn't seem to take long before it was full of water. The truck showed up with a bunch of barrels full of small trout. They put those trout in the pond, and I watched those trout grow up. I learned to swim and fish in that pond. Crayfish moved in, frogs, dragonflies, ducks of all types, blue heron. Then in the mid-80s, the water got really crystal clear. Frogs disappeared, crayfish too. Treetops turned all brown and said it was acid rain. In the 90s, summers were getting hotter and water was getting warmer. Fish got skinnier and had open wounds. They said it was thinning ozone. That pond lasted 30 years. And then the fish disappeared. Even if it ultimately failed, it was still the place where I developed my love of fishing. It's also where I learned to be a respectful and ethical fisher. In this rubber line, it doesn't hurt the fish. It doesn't cut into it like this braided line above here might. I now compete in about 25 fishing tournaments every year. This is the largest fishing tournament for bass in Canada. 150 boats, some of the best fishermen across Canada, people coming up from the States to fish this. The knowledge I gained growing up with that pond, walking around it, fishing in it, swimming, snorkeling, formed a lot of the lessons I now use in my uh, articles and seminars under my tagline, Feel the Bite. It's given me a fairly strong reputation as a fish behavioralist. By no means am I an expert on freshwater and marine ecosystems, but I'm a good listener though. Just like that pond from my childhood, every stream, river, lake, and bay in Canada has a story and someone just waiting to tell it. I, I think people need to, people need to know. People need to know what's going on. People just don't have enough information and I want to see it. I want to see it firsthand myself. I think that could really help the situation in, in terms of creating a deeper understanding of what we're up against here and what, what we need to do. Most of the destruction to the environment is under the water. I think anything, if you can't see them and you don't know they're there, then you don't really care about them. The fish is the silent majority, it doesn't, it doesn't say a word. It never makes, never complains. And I believe strongly in local, local knowledge we grew up fishing for three days a week. We haven't done that for 40 years. And those are the people I want to talk to, and I want to be a voice for them. There's a lot of young people now that's had to move away because there's no work here. And years ago, when we had our ground fishing, our lobster fishing, and everything that was strong, I don't want to be a lone voice. I want to speak on behalf of the people who are being affected directly, the people who make a living from the water up, who depend on the water for their food, for their livelihood, and I'll help get their voice out to whoever, to the public. And the public can then, in turn, will put pressure on the politicians to, to put pressure on the industry to do it differently, to do it better. Seven feet of water, you can fire away. Long bomb. For those of us who are out on the river, you can actually see firsthand the effects of, uh, of what the spills do. Because you see it in the form of condoms and tampon applicators. Sewage and the rainwater is all the same drain. There's 120 kilometers of these combined pipes still in the old part of the city of Ottawa. And if there's a lot of rain entering the storm drains, to prevent it backing up the uh, sewage system and pushing all that stuff back into people's houses, 
they they release the pressure on the system by opening up these 24 valves that allow it to flow directly into the river unprocessed. It's just direct sewage, right? It's everything that gets flushed down the toilets, flushed through the drains. 50% of it is industrial, 50% is residential. I had a, a guy from Detroit, I don't know, three or four years ago. It was when they had even more impressive spills into the river than usual, and so there was all kinds of plastic debris. We saw condoms every day of his trip out here. I think one day he was counting and he got up to 12 or 13. This is what he's seeing in the river in our nation's capital. It's not a proud moment. The city of Rockland, they're 40 kilometers downstream from the city of Ottawa, and they have a processing plant and a daily monitoring system. I mean, they used to monitor once a month, but now they realize that, you know, it can change from day to day depending on what the city of Ottawa does with the uh, with their sewage. There it is. In 2006, like I said, it was a big concern out here. All the dogs in the area that used the river got sick. They all had eye infections, ear infections, lost the hair in their stomach. Um, I had a guest lose my boat off the shore in Hawkesbury that week, and I had to go for a good swim to get it. And my hands are cut regularly from handling fish, so my hands are in and, in and out of the dirty water. And I actually contracted uh, an extremely rare virus that um, that I still have uh, residual effects from that, and it started to paralyze the muscles in my face, and I got antibiotics and treatment for it um, before it went too far. So is it a coincidence? Well, it could have been, but in my mind, there's a pretty, pretty straight cause and effect. It's something that I find personally reprehensible. And if you ask most people, I think they'd tell you that it's reprehensible. And yet we still allow this to go on. We, we, quietly, we quietly tolerate it. And I spend half my year usually out west. You know, it's, a, it's the same problem on the, on the west coast. The raw uh, sewage. Yeah, in Halifax. And it's just a practice that that we've been able to, that, that, that Mother Nature's been able to tolerate us doing for, for a long time, and she doesn't tolerate it so much anymore. It sort of came as a surprise to everyone, including me when I was around eight years old. I was in grade three, and my teacher was asked me to read a word off the chalkboard. I had been getting around that for about a month just by being a bit of a joker but she got a little tired of my jokes and came back and gave me a good whack with her yardstick. And I said, I, look, I can't read your word on your chalkboard because I can't see it. No GPS coverage. Oh, I just lost my GPS coverage. No GPS coverage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my hat, hang on, whoa, 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 whoa. She didn't believe me anyways. I was sent to the, uh, sent home, sent to the doctor, sent to the hospital for a month in Toronto. Couldn't figure it out, but you know, the long and short it was, I was registered blind. All right. I lost my hat, though. Went back to school a month later. I got it. And my principal said, Lawrence, they're, uh, they're saying you should go to the school for the blind. It's a residential school. He said, but I think as long as you can get along, you, can, you should stay. So I did, and I, I tried to get along and made it through uh, all the way through grade 12, uh, doing it that way, without, without it much support. Hear the fish jump the boys throw. Anava. Come on. Big trees. <laughs> I've been fishing since I was five years old and I have a fishing tackle business in England. And my business partner in England used to come here on holiday and catch carp. And he kept on at me to come over here to fish with him. And I goes, why do I want to go all the way to Canada to catch carp? I've got carp two miles from my house. These are different, these are different. And eventually, he persuaded me to come, and I just fell in love with the place. It's, I mean, you guys have got no idea what you've got here. It, it is the best carp fishing in the world, bar none. Your beeper's going off, um, eh? That's, I've got a fish on there. Shall I go and land go it? Ahead, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Before you run out of line. See, in England, we're sitting, we're used to waiting about two days to catch a fish. <laughs> <laughs> Only in Canada. <laughs> the reason that the guys come here no carp in Europe fight like these. Overall, I've met fabulous 
people fishing and I've had great times when there's some lovely, lovely guys fish around here. But I also see terrible things. I see fish slaughtered and I watch guys go out, get their walleye limit, come back in, empty it into the trunks of their car and go out and get it again and again and again. It's probably around the 20 pound mark. You know I'm a conservationist, I don't kill anything. All my fish go back. Um, I don't mind people taking a fish to eat, but when it's wholesale slaughter and when I see people taking 10, 15, 20 pound carp, because they're selling them to restaurants in Montreal, to be honest, it breaks my heart. We get a lot of that reaction. Why would you want to catch it and then put it back? I think it's just a kind of psychological barrier of fishing for something which is sport rather than to bang it on the head and take it home. In England, we cherish carp. Yeah. I've learned that it's different here. Firstly, there's so many of them. I mean, I couldn't comprehend of a water with this, this amount of carp in it. It does not exist in England. If you killed a carp in England, it would be in the newspapers. It would be an absolute national outcry. <laughs> you know, these are fish with names. Well, Benson, I think, was 62 pounds when he died. They had it recorded being caught 112 times in his career. After it died, that fishery, um, it went from having a five-year waiting list to go and fish it to anybody could buy a ticket the next day. Why are people so much more protective of birds and deer and polar bears than they are of fish? My theory is because fish don't scream. They don't really make a lot of noise. They don't do anything, do they? No. So I think it's less emotional. I mean, unless you're a sports fisherman, yeah. what's a fish? It's, a, it's like not much more than a vegetable. Yeah. Oh, that's a fish. <laughs> your rod, Lawrence. I'm hooked. What's a fishing rod for? Yeah, you use it for launching your bait. But in reality, most of the time what you're using the fishing rod for is for feeling. It's to transmit the sensation that's coming up the fishing line to your hand. So it's just a white cane for all intents and purposes. Sure, there's all sorts of sight fishing that people do, but there's most of it what we're doing is we're fishing blind. We don't see what's down there. Got him. You got it? Yeah. OK. I'm coming down. <laughs> and the other thing that upsets yeah. me is the amount of rubbish. This, this has been cleared. We, we come down and clear the swims during the week. Yeah. I clear all the swims. By Monday, they're filthy again. Full of plastic bottles. Plastic and... bottles, like they're picnics and they throw everything away. And in England, there is no free fishing. Everybody has to pay. And not only that, if you're caught leaving litter on a fishery, you're banned you're not allowed to go back again. So every fishery in England is pristine. I understand you, it's one of the most beautiful countries I've ever visited, and people don't seem to cherish it as they should. OK, he's out. People think carp look ugly. I think it's one of the most beautiful fish for me to touch and feel. It's everything's bigger than life. The scales are bigger than life. Those are his sensors, eh? Those whiskers? They like your stick, but are they, Lawrence? <laughs> <laughs> He's OK? Yeah, it's good. That's a 25-pounder, eh? Yeah. A lot of people think blind people have heightened senses of hearing and touch. It's not the case. No one increases their neurological capacities when they have a deficit in one area. But what you do is you develop a better sense, a better use, a more dependency, a higher dependency, and therefore a more refined ability to use that sense. You know, but you look at a baby, a baby, first thing they want to do is taste it. Then they want to smell it. Then they want to hold it, feel it, and then they look at it. But the looking is the last thing. It's the least, most interesting stimulus of all the senses. And yet, that's the one we're told we should depend on. And it's probably the most objective, least subjective sense of, of all of us. So if we only interpret our environment through our eyes, we're in, we're in a way detaching from the environment. C'est beau. C'est beau, monsieur. Getting a French dog was a real fantastic way for me to experience the uh, Quebec culture and also to uh, work on my French. 
If we learn to understand our environment and our place within the environment through the feel of it between our toes. Sorry, Maestro. We'll try again. The feel of it in our hands. Oh, now I'm in the weeds. The smell, oh. the taste, the sounds, and the sight. We become part of it. I'm in the close to land because I can hear trees all over around there and all around there, birds all around, all around there. We become part of our environment. It's not something we're uh, visiting or observing. It's an amazing, amazing feeling. of Alberta's oil sands, you might wonder what they're doing to the nearby Athabasca River. It is the main water source for mining operations. The industry and provincial government have always said that if there are toxins in the water, it's not their fault. Today, a new report suggests otherwise. It links high levels of pollutants in the Athabasca to the mining. Just beside you here is a dragline bucket from one of the historic oil sands. And that bucket is about from 1949. One scoop of this bucket could then be turned into one barrel of oil. This would be about two tons of sand. That's right. Oop. Oh, I'm sorry. I <laughs> no, been watching more closely. No, no. And in my hand here, I've got a sample of oil sands. If you just put your fingers okay. inside the beaker there. Wow, it's like tar. That's well, why yeah. they originally called it tar sands? Yeah, well, that's, that's the name that has been given it because it's got that consistency. Bitumen has that tar-like consistency. The difference, is, <laughs> the difference is bitumen is a natural petroleum product and tar is a man-made substance. Okay, so, so that's now, the big difference is. So they don't call it tar sands? No, anymore. it's oil sands. So your arm span can't get to the top of it. No, no. Here's another sample of that sand I helped you to begin with. So All there's right. the beaker right in front of you. Oh, okay. And to get the bitumen out, we're gonna add hot water. It does work pretty quick. I'm using water that's hotter than industry used. Industry would use maybe 50 to 80 degrees Celsius. You can see that this kettle just boiled. The water's still bubbling. Boy, so. the, the smell coming out of there is that's intense. So wow. already just from adding that heat, the bitumen has started to release because what the heat is doing, it's changing the viscosity. And as it loosens from the sand, the bitumen will start to rise to the top. Oh, it's gotten quite soft, eh? Because oil and water don't mix, that bitumen's going to come to the top of the water. And if you touch the sand in this beaker, that'll give you a sense of what what came, what? That tailing sand oh, feeling, okay, so it's yeah. very different than yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's a very fine sand. The middle layer in this beaker is the water layer, so all that water that I added is sitting there in the middle. It's a very murky color now. The third layer is the layer of bitumen that I said was going to float to the top. That's the product yeah, that yeah. can be turned into all sorts of things that we use in our daily lives. Yeah, so right. just right on the edge of the paper there, yeah. touch of oh, the, the, the bitumen. bitumen there? So that's. Oh, that's, that's the, that, that is really sticky. But wow. even after we've scraped that bitumen off the top, there is a layer of oil that will continue to settle on top of the water. So it's important that the water that's used in extraction isn't put back in the Athabasca River or elsewhere in the environment. So it's put into man-made tailings ponds where it settles out in the tailings ponds just like it settled out in the beaker. And the water? The water is reused in the extraction process so not as high amounts of new water and fresh water are having to be taken every time. experiment with the uh, beakers and the boiling water. She goes, look, there's three layers, there's sand, there's water, and there's vitrium. And I'm thinking, yeah, but you didn't mention that fourth layer, which is the odor that's coming off. And that's all chemicals, too. Uh, it's, it's, she couldn't see it, so it doesn't count. But, but for me, that's really what counted, was that smell coming off that beaker. 
driving along as, as we're passing by the tailings ponds between Sincrude and Suncor, just rolling down the window and smelling the, uh, the smell from the tailings ponds being carried across by the wind coming right into the truck here. It's just, my eyes were stinging, my lungs are scratchy, and it's just absolutely horrific. It's, it's like someone's tarring a new roof right beside us, plus all these other chemicals and smells that I've never smelled before. It's, it's very, very no noxious. Uh, I run heavy equipment for uh, Shell Canada. Yeah? The, yeah, at Albion. The big trucks? Yeah. You've seen these ponds and you've seen the size of them. And, I mean, it must be impressive. Oh yeah, they're, they're huge. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. They're like lakes? Yeah, small, yeah, small, small lakes. And they're toxic? Yeah, uh, that, that they would be because whatever chemicals they uh, add to the water to help the oil separate from the sand goes back out into the pond. It's a little bit of a necessary evil that we need to do this to produce oil. Yeah. We're so dependent on oil. I don't know. I think all our lives would change if we stop producing oil. It's, we're so dependent on it. Everything we do. Even our fishing trip up to Athabasca, unfortunately, had to do with that very same process, right? We had to fly. Yeah, that's right. Need gas we, for we the plane. The fuel, the oil. Gas yeah. for the boats. Yeah, that's right. It wouldn't have happened. We would have been a long canoe trip. Yeah, that's right. You're not kidding, yeah. especially on the way back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you fish around here in Fort McMurray? Yeah, I fish in the Athabasca River. Uh, uh, upstream see, from ups, the... Upstream into the clear water. Yeah. Yeah. And what have you heard of the downstream fishing? Um, not not such good things about it. Where do you fish around here? Uh, down to the snot. And that's uh, where, where it, goes, it goes into the Athabasca there? Clear water and the uh, Athabasca. Two versus me. Now right. what do you catch in there? Walleye? Uh, well, I, or pickerel, I call them. But, uh, pickerel, yeah. What do you call? Uh, Are they good eating? No, I wouldn't eat nothing from here. No. no. Why? Because it's all contaminants. Now, I have heard people tell me that there is a limit. They, the town actually have a limit on how much you're supposed to eat in a certain amount of time. Yeah. So I mean, I've heard that from two or three people that you know you're only supposed to eat so many over a certain period of time. So I'm thinking, I mean, can't be good if there's a restriction on how much you're supposed to eat. But. Would you feed it to your kids? Uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, I've never really took any out there, but if I caught some there, I would feed it to them. Yeah. No one's telling you don't eat it? No, that's right. That's, yeah. I mean, no one's putting it out there that it's absolutely something you shouldn't do. I mean, they, they all say you should eat one a week. Well, it scares a lot of people, so they just don't eat it at all. I do that the best. Do but, people swim in the river? Uh, I haven't seen people swimming here, no. No way? Why, because it's cold or just... Uh, it's pretty dirty. It's dirty, eh? Yeah. It's not, it's not that clean. Ever since Sincrude and Suncor, they have their plant here, they're saying the fish are getting sick and poison, I guess. It's taken away from you, in a sense, right? I mean, it's... Well, yeah, our, uh, our heritage, like, you know? Yeah. The fish as uh, 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 our food. I think passing through to some place, passing through some place. Oh, they right there, you can you smell it strong. You can smell it. Yeah. You can smell the oil sand. And it's every midnight, you know, coming from St. Crude. The it gas? It comes right out here, yeah. It smells like cat piss because we got at least 39 at last time plants right around us. All the pollution is coming in. There's been cancer, there's also uh, eczema, um, asthma. The tap water is not safe to drink? Try drinking it. And you can even taste the taste like muscat. They yes. say we're not supposed to drink that. We could use it for cooking, I guess, but we're not supposed to drink like that, like this. We, we get the uh, water bottles like that. In return for the water they take from us. I noticed there's a lot of new houses here and a lot of good businesses going in Fort McKay. A lot of money coming in. Oh, yes. Is it worth it? No, as far as I know. Is it worth it? No, because everybody tried to be, tried to live like white people. They want to live in cafe, that's all they want now. That's not life, not life to me anyway. Because I know how we used to live long time ago. There's no fishing while they're bothering us. We're just free, yeah. go out in the bush. Have a good life. 
We're here at the Suncor Community Center, a recreational facility donated to Fort McMurray in 2010 from the Suncor Energy Company. It's the place to play indoors. Tennis, hockey, curling, badminton, swimming, it's all available inside. Concrete, bumpy concrete and blocks. That uh, mural was just, it was like a very sad afterthought of uh, the island that this place was built on, McDonald Island, with the animals playing on the island. You know, it's almost a reflection of the, the guilty sin that has taken over the island. When the snow melts here in the spring, there's enough oil collected in the snow from the pollutants in the air that they figure it's equivalent to a 5,000 barrel oil spill being released into the environment when the snow melts in the spring. I think the second thing that um, I think was really poignant was the dedication of this center to the past mayor of Fort McMurray. And the uh, statement that no one believes stronger in the future of Fort McMurray than Mr. Knight, the mayor. I mean, the future there's no future here. This, this is totally unsustainable. Once the oil's gone or once there's no more demand, just like for the uranium, it's, there is no future. I mean, you got these oil companies here, right? Like, they do what they want. There's never been all the leases that this the Alberta government has never turned down an oil lease in Alberta to a company that wanted to exploit the uh, oil resources in the land. They've never said no for any reason. They've always said yes. And the Alberta government said, well, we have a, a fund for all the money that's been brought. We take a small, small percentage and it goes into a fund. So if those companies should go bankrupt, we can restore the land to the way it was. But that fund is so minuscule, there's nowhere near enough money in that fund to put, the, put things back the way they were. And the same thing with the uranium mines. Right now it's costing the government millions, you know, 70, 80 million dollars to start to clean up those uranium mines because the old mining companies just walked away. say this and I'll say it in a positive way, at least the Saskatchewan government is doing something to try to prevent people from injuring themselves by, you know, utilizing the fish out of this bay. I would not eat fish out of this bay. But, but the fish in this bay, they're the same pike on the outside of the bay. Yes. They swim in and out of here all they the time. They come and go. Right? These fish here probably never go to the North Shore, but yes, they do go uh, along the South Shore. And, and it's mainly the swimming and the kids swimming in the air and yeah. kicking up the muck. Yeah. That would be, a, seems to me, a bigger issue. But the actual physical plant, you can see right there, that, that's the whole plant right there. All these buildings are being torn down. 
everything, everything uh, supposedly by October is supposed to be gone, but uh, we don't believe they can get it done in that period of time. They should have probably come in here and, uh, and you know, drill everything and dynamite it and blew it down and then clean it up after. But because of the asbestos, they, they say they can't do that. We can see, you know, we just passed what you call Radiation Bay, and we saw the sign that's saying, don't come into this bay, no fishing, no swimming, uh, it's radioactive. The mining industry, particularly when it came to uranium, knew that the product that they were producing had uh, some very bad effects on the environment and this is why the signing was put in place. This mine closed over 40 years ago, and those signs are just have been put up in the last, what? Probably those signs were in the last two to three years. There's a moral obligation that uh, these companies should have cleaned up behind themselves. Uh, unfortunately, because of usually the, the mines going bust, the uh, people who invested in the companies took their profits and ran, and usually there was no money left to be able to do this kind of thing. So in this, the more modern age, they're ensuring that that money is set aside to, to hopefully clean up all of these environmental disasters. I'm at the end of my life, not at the beginning of it, and I don't want to see my grandchildren inherit a polluted world. Well, that's exactly what we got here, Uranium yeah. City, and got our mind. I mean, the same, same thing could, our, our, our kids could be looking at in 50 years at the other end of the lake at Fort McMurray. Yeah, you don't know. Only 50 times bigger. You know, we've been in this town, Uranium City, and uh, driving around, and I've been exploring things with you, and uh, there's nothing here. I, I hear a raven, I hear an eagle, I hear a lot of flies, and I hear wind in the trees. This was a town of 5,000 people, and it's the kind of town I grew up in, and I feel this tremendous sense of loss, of, of being in a place at the wrong time. Feeling disconnected, you know, it's out of. Yeah. I have six kids and two grandchildren. And when I hear what's going on again, you know, another oil leakage, another, another, uh, you know, boat runs aground, another, yeah, I mean, the St. Lawrence the other day, Gulf of Mexico, and, you know, the, uh, uh, the Chinese oil tanker off the uh, Australian coastline six two months what? ago. Two to what? Wait. What? Listen. Okay, let's go. You know, at some point, there's going to be a disaster that we just won't be able to recover from. That saddens me, that, that we can, that we're coming to the point where we're going to make those decisions not to clean it up anymore.
morning last, last year, January 11th. For the first time since I don't even know when they were boarding in January. Uh, January 11th last year, it was still open. When, did it, when normally would you take your boat out? 10 years ago, 15 years ago? October. October, the boats would be all out. Yeah. 10 years ago, we have probably been frozen fjord right now. This would be all frozen here. This everything here. Yes. Nobody in town do fishing in summer. Right, and here we are in November. You're still catching fish, halibut. And um, you got a quota? For me, they, they gave me a 30,000 pound quota. Did you, are you going to get an Arctic char quota next year? For the Arctic char quota, it's a lottery now for it used to be open for anybody for first come first serve, but there's too many uh, people starting to go fishing for char, and it's, it's a lottery now. So there's more and more people getting in on the commercial fishing. Yes. And uh, as Manasi, he's not originally from Penalto, as all of them are. Uh, they were uh, born and raised outside uh, in what we used to call outpost camps uh, yeah, before yeah. the government uh, but brought everybody in to uh, live in this settlement. Yeah. The problem that he's seeing is that um, uh, the duration of uh, winter ice fisheries, uh, it's much too short yeah. uh, nowadays because of uh, global warming. Uh, these uh, fish trawlers or uh, fishing boats, larger fishing boats that are coming into Cumberland Sound, that may have a, mm -hmm. a drastic effect on uh, the stock. Uh, Is the quota being dis established by DFO, Department of Fisheries, or is the uh, Inuit having some say in the quota? <laughs> A local Inuit doesn't have a lot of say, no, I um, and it's always uh, the big companies or, um, uh, and uh, along with the government that uh, uh, meet uh, certain times of the year to set uh, a, a quota system. <laughs> But with um, today's technology, scientists are coming in without any traditional knowledge. They impose what they think they know on, uh, on the local fishermen. And uh, he's always been against that. There's just too many people coming from the outside and thinking that they know uh, what's best uh, for this community. We asked the fishermen to leave the heads on the fish because almost all this fish is going to China, almost every bit of it. And the Chinese want the heads. In fact, they pay almost as much for the heads as they will for the fish. But the Chinese take them like that. We don't do any further processing because their labor costs are so much uh, lower than ours. There's three kinds of fishing out there. They either catch them on hooks or with gill nets or with a trawl or dragging a net through the water. Yeah. But in the sound here, they only use the hooks. Only hooks, because that's all we're allowed to use. They're concerned about gill nets, well, in trawl as well, yeah. uh, getting into whales. Yeah. Whales are a, a big cultural issue up here, and, and so they don't want to be harming whales or the narwhal or a seal and things like this. This is a dredge that was brought in here to uh, dig out the bay and uh, make it possible for larger boats to come in and unload their uh, catches and cargo. It's going to open up the commercial fishing in the uh, Cumberland Sound to a much bigger degree. And what we have is an opportunity now with the ice not coming anymore or coming so much later, you have a, a fishing season that's now six months long. So that, that makes it uh, attractive to buy fishing boats, to bring in larger fishing boats, to bring in the equipment, to bring in the processing facilities. It's a way for the um, Inuit to get economically independent and to achieve wealth and prosperity. What it means to the fish, eh, who knows? I mean, they would like to make sure it's, a, it's something that lasts a long time. That's an, a, a principle of the Inuit culture is to fish sustainably, to hunt sustainably. But uh, we don't know uh, how that's gonna translate in terms of this large commercial activity. Can it be done sustainably? Who knows? There's science is out on that. No one's done the science. And you know, what it's meant in the South, it's, it's never been good, right? It's never lasted. You know, it's cold water. These fish don't grow as fast as they do in, in, in warm water. 
Fish in cold water grow a lot slower. Of potential. And it could very well be what we have here is the beginning of, you know, the end. With weeping dreams and just enough nightfall. Well, it started off I lost the central vision. So I had all my peripheral. So I could do most of the sports that other kids could do. I just couldn't read fine print without magnification. I could go into stores and see all the beautiful lures on the walls for sale. And I helped out, you know, a couple of our local sports stores in the town where I grew up. I, I sort of managed the, uh, the tackle displays. You know? But uh, then I lost my ability to see uh, that level of detail, and that spread out. They didn't think it was going to spread out. I was always told it wouldn't spread out. But at around uh, age 21, 22, I realized that it, I couldn't go out, I couldn't deal with sudden light changes anymore where I went out at night, it was really dark and I would start bumping into things. Or if I, um, in the winter time, if I came into a building, I couldn't see anything because my eyes were adjusted to the snow. So uh, at that point, I sort of lear started to learn to live without looking. And uh, that was what they call becoming functionally blind. I could still see some shapes and so on, but I needed uh, to do, learn to do things by not looking. So I stopped buying fishing tackle because I would go into a tackle store and I couldn't, everything's in the box, so all I could feel was boxes. And I couldn't see the pretty lures inside the boxes. And I couldn't read the magazines anymore about what the new technology was coming out. So for the next 20 years or so, I just basically fished with what I had. This is a small bass. Let him go. And then the internet came along, and with my talking computer, huh. Future. Oh. I could now read again about new innovations and new technology and oh man there's so much out there and I had so much access to so much information again I've overcomplicated my fishing life again you know I went from keeping it simple through necessity I had no choice to now I'm trying all these new things so it's been a bit of a catch up for the last number of years in my 40s uh, got to the point now where I can only just see a little bit of light perception. Like what can you see around you now? N uh, nothing. There's no, I think it's, we're just surrounded by a sort of a constant sort of shade of some sort of another, so there's no light source in front of me, so I can't see a, a light source. Can you feel on your right that the light is coming? Yeah, I can feel the sun on my right arm. I can hear boats in the distance Saviors out of ordinary people. Now they sing in a symphony of keepers, and they hail in the harmony of saviors. Got to live. of the northern cod from inshore water is a calamity that threatened dozens of fishing villages and thousands of Canadian families. Only five years ago, the scientists were reporting that the stock was in excellent shape. Well, we got blown off the water today on a hurricane coming through, keeping us off the water. Where's the schooner now, anyways? Straight ahead of you right now. Is it right here? It's right, right there? This is a traditional fishing boat for the cod fishery for hundreds of years. The boat captain would take out six to eight small wooden boats strapped onto the deck of the boat with two guys for each boat and start dropping them out into the ocean. Two guys in each little wooden boat with a tub of hooks and lines and a tub of bait. And that would be dropped and they would circle around putting these little boats out on the ocean and circle back around eventually and pick up the cod and give more bait and they'd do that all day until it got dark and uh, then race back to the wharf. First boat back to the wharf got the best prices. That boat was replaced by many other of these larger fishing boats and larger fishing boats and eventually factory trawlers and a mobile fleet that was licensed in the 80s once we got the 200 mile limit in Canada and pushed out the international fleet. We, Canada licensed its own offshore fleet. 
The undigested villain of this piece is the Deep Sea Dragon, the most indiscriminate, ravaging, relentless machine ever to rake and vacuum the oceans of the world. Underwater strip mining. The dragger fishery of other nations and our own worked to biological meltdown on the east coast of Canada. Within 10 to 15 years, we wiped out our cod stocks. After 500 years of fishing, it took us 10 years to deplenish the stock. À mon point de vue personnel, le grand coupable c'était un surplus de la pêche par les gros bateaux mobiles. Je pense c'est difficile pour le gouvernement à dire non à le, le grand euh, compagnie. Oui, c'était difficile à dire non, mais la journée a, a venu quand il a été obligé de dire non. Ottawa est en train d'annoncer un moratorium sur Northern Cod, un fishing ban qui va coûter 20 000 jobs. Understandably, people are anxious for more details, but today, Fisheries Minister John Crosby refused to reveal them. On dit en, en canadien, c'était une claque de côté de la face quand ça arrivait. Là. Il y a beaucoup qui étaient dépendants 100% du revenu de, du poisson de fonds. I didn't take the fish from the goddamn water. Well, who took it? You and your goddamn people took it. You and your people took it. No, I'm trying to do it. Yes, you're doing shit on it. Les autres euh, comme pêcheurs côtiers, on avait encore le, le homard et le crabe, ça fait qu'on a survécu encore. C'est une ressource comme la pêche d'eau mort qui, qui a, à la Nouvelle-Écosse, qui vaut au-dessus d'un billion par année. Ça fait que tu peux pas ôter ça de l'économie de la Nouvelle-Écosse. There was a guy from Yarmouth that came here and he went to put in a little farm, maybe four or five pens, just a small little thing for his family. That would do them, you know. We were sort of against it, but it's something new. Probably didn't know anything the effects would have, you know, then of fish farming, because nobody knew anything about it. And then, of course, they switched to salmon. And they expanded and again? And expanded, and this time, big time, with bigger, biggest pens you could get for salmon, and just stock them full. The chill lobsters just stopped coming in there altogether, and it was getting polluted, very polluted. And there was a smelly smell, too, like the rotten eggs, like the sulfur. You can see it on your gear, slime on the bottom, algae, slime algae, which is produced by nutrients that was never there because there was nothing ever there to cause these things before. But all the waste from that, those pens will flush north, so that will basically pollute our entire harbor. Some of the information that we've heard that buried female lobsters or reproductive lobsters don't go around that sort of thing. They just, well, they, they change their migration pattern, and as a result of that, if we don't have reproduction, we don't have a future lobster fishery. Short-term gain for long-term pain. It's easy to sacrifice things you don't see in front of you that, I mean, when you got these, everything happening below the surface and the only thing you really see on top is uh, some innocent marker buoys, it doesn't seem that bad, does it? No, exactly. No, most of the destruction to the environment is under the water. I'm the chair of the Freeport Community Development Association. Cook's Aquaculture came down here and they did a, they, uh, a sort of a public meeting where they introduced themselves and said, here's what we want to do and what do you guys think about it? And everybody said, we don't want it here, go away. Uh, they went ahead, Sterling Bellabo uh, said, yeah, go ahead and do it. And within 24 hours of him granting the licenses, they were out putting those cages out in St. Mary's Bay. I can't understand how a big company come in and can put something like that there when I've been fishing it for so long and all my neighbors and everything and my father before me and so on, right? I just can't see how that can be allowed to happen. I got nothing again raising salmon, but if they're gonna raise them, it should be on land. Yeah. where they can look after things, right? And where they put these salmon farms is one of the richest lobster fishing areas. It's also a spawning ground. You know, yes, we're losing our, our bottom, you know, that we can't set traps here, but it's the pollution that's what's on top of the water, it's going to shore, it's on our beaches. We ask all these questions of uh, DFO, Department of Fisheries. They have not answered one of our questions, okay? Not one. I mean, you hear the minister, this drives me crazy. Say, there is no evidence that these things are gonna hurt the, the lobster fishery. Well, the reason he can say there's no evidence is because they haven't done a goddamn study. We had some recreational divers go down and take photographs. The farm itself is eight hectares, and the extent of the area contaminated and smothered by waste um, 
measured 80 hectares. That ten, that's 10 times the size of the lease. They should be made to pump that out. Can you go dump your septic tank in the ocean? I can't. They can come here and shit in our backyard. And when they're all said and done, they can, can, can leave. It's the only food production industry that's allowed to dump its manure and waste matter all into the environment untreated. What'll happen is that we'll have a fish farm out here polluting our bay. It might create two or three local jobs, if that, part-time jobs. But the fish processing plant will be over in the South Shore. So we get the shit, they get the jobs. This fish farm here that we're walking towards, it's located pretty much at the mouth of the Medway River. In Hurricane Juan a few years back, uh, 500,000 sea run trout escaped. Our major concern as a, a salmon association was those scapies coming into our river. We have a fish farm with, with salmon that will, will mess up the genetics and DFO is doing really nothing about it. They're, they're allowing this to take place. We hear all the time that when you put a fish farm near a salmon river, the wild salmon population drops. Autom it, 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 within, within a reasonable period of time, and we're talking maybe two to three years. We've seen what's happened with these open net fish farms all over the world. Chile, Norway, Scotland. The dam technology doesn't work, it's polluting. Let's really move forward with the way it should be done. Containment. And do it on closed containment. But there's right on, on the right on the DFO website, they said they've done studies and it's not economically viable. Well, well, if it's not economically viable to do it environmentally properly and protect the livelihoods of other people, then they shouldn't bloody well be doing it. And this is what we're trying to get through to the government and through to the industry. Yeah, the guys down the coast have a new slogan. It says, farm the land, fish the sea. The only thing we got now here is the lobster fishery. There's no ground fishery. They ruined the ground fishery. And if they ruin the lobster fishery, then that's it. I don't think that big is always better. I, I think that we should maybe scale back a little bit and look at the picture a little bit differently and try to have something for our generation coming up not to just get in here and try to fill our bank book full and forget about the next generation. I don't think that's the way to fish. From the very beginning, this country has been based on stripping its resources, from beaver to cod to trees to wheat, minerals, oil, gas. And water is going to be next on the block, you know? At some point, we're going to be selling water. But why can't our leaders, I mean, why can't we convince our leaders to say, okay, there's certain things that aren't sellable, and that is, you know, our environment. We can't sell our environment. Perfect. So uh, is there any holes on this boat? I'll just use my stick, and I'm just going to have a quick nope. look around the boat, get a feel for it, if that's OK. Lawrence, I've been uh, actually studying sharks um, since I was five years old. Wow. When I first seen the, my first shark. And I, after I spent my 20 years in the Navy, I opened up my own shark charter. I want it to be different than everybody else. So every shark that we catch, we tag them, we measure them, we photograph them, and we release them. Has anyone re-caught any of the sharks? Many times. I've had a return recaptured off the uh, mouth of the Amazon River. No. Had another one just recaptured down off of Cuba. When a shark gets recaptured, the information that comes back tells me how big the shark was and how long it's been at sea and where it was recaptured. So if the shark's been at sea for three years or four years, and he's only grown four inches, then we know that they're, they're a very slow-growing animal. In fact, they are. And they don't live very long. That's the problem, is that um, we're, we're killing them faster than they can reproduce. They say between 100 and 150 million are actually um, slaughtered each and every year, uh, either for their fins or for bycatch. And we've lost 90% of our sharks globally in the last 20 years. Um, they're telling us that there's all kinds of large blues that are offshore that are being caught on the long lines and 95% of them are dead. So they're attached to this 40 mile long fishing line yeah. with a 10 foot leader yeah, and they, and they can't sizes. just keep swimming in circles. They, f they breathe by ram. By moving. Water, water yeah. ro flowing through their melt over their gills and by, out the side, yeah. If they stop moving forward, they stop breathing. They stop breathing. What the public fails to realize is that sharks have been on the planet for 450 million years and 70% um, of the world's oxygen comes from our oceans and sharks are our top predator in the ocean. So if you remove the top predator from the ocean, the food chain 
will in sense reverse itself and it'll start working itself all the way back down till, the, till right. it gets to the organism that produces the oxygen, which is phytoplankton. A 650 billion tons of phytoplankton is produced from the oceans around the world. And over the last uh, five years, that 650 billion tons has now dropped to um, 400 billion tons. So it, it means that we need to look after these things that we have in the ocean here. Yeah, it's coming down, Lord. Yeah. Now yeah, he's coming up to the surface. Beautiful color. Okay, Lord, that's good. Okay. Can I come? Yeah, hook is out. Okay. So, see, my hand is right here. Yeah. You're gonna put your hand there. Got it. Got They're pectors. huge pet. Yeah, it's big pet. 61. 61 inches to the uh, fork. fork. There you go. Okay. And that thing there is called a nectane membrane, the same as our eyelid, right? That's how I check to see if he builds up lactic acid in his body. Sharks have a sixth sense, the ability to be able to detect very minute electrical current. All the little pinholes are filled with a jelly called the Apuli Lorenzini. Okay. And they're very, very, very sensitive to electrical current. There's his nose, and his lat line runs all the way down along that blue. Can I get a feel how long he is? Yeah, keep coming. Yeah. Keep coming. Yeah, that's his nose? That's his nose. That's a good size fish, eh? That is a good okay. fish. All right, I'm gonna lift him up with you and we'll put him in together, okay? Okay, sounds good. Okay, okay ready? Up. Stand up. Okay. And I'm gonna pick her up. Right. Your belly to the floor. Okay. All right, Lawrence, we're right here, bud. Okay. We're just gonna let him go there, let her go. Okay. And there he goes, slow. Swimming out with a little tag in his back. When it comes to the sturgeon, some of the Stalo communities um, see the sturgeon actually as, as ancestors. Our good ancestors were the ones that were transformed into sturgeon. There used to be, at one time, hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of sturgeon living along the lower river. Uh, there's troubling developments right now. The, the sturgeon population on the Fraser is not, is not um, replacing itself. Right now, the, the sturgeon on the Fraser River, um, although they are classified as a threatened species, are doing quite well in the lower part of the river. The upper part of the river, not so much. In some of those areas in the upper part of the river, the sturgeon have been classified as endangered. We're a very strongly resource-based province, and as a consequence of those industries, you know, large areas of land have been clear-cut, a lot of sediment has moved into the river that's affected the habitat in a great way. So most of the problems that the sturgeon are facing in the upper river are habitat-related, as pressure from development from land and population growth. Gravel is a huge commodity. It's, it, we need it if we want to continue to grow. Uh, just at the outlet of the Fraser Canyon, there is some uh, gravel removal, uh, largely as a public safety measure for flooding. related to, to flooding. We've got professional studies that show that taking gravel out of that river, at least at the levels that are being taken out, is not going to change the flood profile at all, but there are taking gravel from key areas that have been identified in the past biologists from the, the province as being potential prime sturgeon spawning habitats. One of the perspectives that we always have to consider in any kind of a system, whether it's a river system or whether it's an on-land system, is the biodiversity of that system. It's critical to have all these different species. They're there for a reason and they're part of a fabric of, a, of nature that's been built over eons and eons. And if you lose that one iconic or single large species, it could upset the entire balance within that system. They're a canary in a coal mine, yeah. really. Yeah. You know, they, if the, the sturgeon don't make it, then this river is, is not gonna make it. Fishing teaches you patience, right? Eh? You know? If you're not going to have patience, then you, you should, really shouldn't be fishing. We've just seen him, but we haven't talked about how old is Maestro? Maestro is going to be seven years old in January. He's my fifth guide dog. Five guide dogs in 27 years. <coughs> 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 
Je m'appelle Éric Saint-Pierre, je suis fondateur de Mirage. On est la première école de chien guide au Canada. On a rencontré Laurence il y a déjà près d'une quinzaine d'années. Et depuis ce temps-là, on est un peu comme, comme des frères en réalité. On a travaillé longtemps ensemble, on s'apprécie beaucoup. C'est l'anglais que j'aime le mieux du Canada. Laurence, c'est quelqu'un qui est assez sportif aussi, autant dans sa tête que dans son corps. Donc, à ce moment-là, ça prend un chien qui est à l'épreuve d'à peu près tout. You know, the first guide dog you have is the one you is the one you, you think of the most, right? Because it's your first guide dog. It's a, it's a special dog. Even if it's not your best dog, it's the one you love the most. Because each dog has its own personality and its own way of doing things. And uh, you just have to accept that and you work yourself around your new dog. Dog's not going to change to fit you. You got to change to fit your dog. They've done studies and they've shown that people that have been blind a long time, their processing of what they hear it starts to be undertaken by their, uh, the part of the brain that normally processes sight. So you start to use that visualization part of your brain to process what you're hearing. They, they know that now by looking at the brain activity. I used to dream visually. I, I don't anymore. Any visual aspects to my dreams are muddy or just crazy, like a Salvador Dali painting. I dream in audio now, stories. Sometimes I miss it. Like uh, when university starts up, I, I live in an area where there's a lot of university housing and if I'm with a friend and they're going, Lawrence, if you could just see all these beautiful young ladies walking around. <laughs> but there's other times where I think I'm really happy and uh, I remember when 9-11 and the people were jumping out of those towers hmm. and a friend of mine said, Lawrence, you're so lucky you don't have to see that on TV. Come on, fish. I wish I could see my kids and my grandchildren. You know, my daughter, my four-year-old daughter came up to me the other day and says, look, Daddy, I got a trick for you. I said, what's that? And she goes, look, a rabbit. And I said, oh, yeah. And she, uh, and she put a little stuffed play toy rabbit in my hand. But, you know, my wife told me uh, later, she said, did, did Lily show you her rabbit trick? And I said, I think so. Why? And she goes, well, she has this big floppy magician's hat. And she ha wears it on her head. And then she takes it off. And she has a ma magician's cane. She waves it over the hat. And then she pulls a rabbit out of the hat. You know, but she didn't explain, Lily didn't explain all that to me, right? When she showed me her trick and I missed that also, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so her trick was really lost on me. And because of that, Lily didn't really, she didn't mind, you know? It wasn't a big deal for Lily, but... <laughs> but afterwards I felt so bad, you know? I said, my God, I missed the whole trick. All my kids have grown up knowing that, that all that cuteness is wasted on me. We have a, another kind of relationship. We have a relationship built on communications, right? On exchanging ideas and feelings, you know? Now you lose in one way, you make up for it in another. This thing is strong. 
I haven't gained an inch of line on this fish yet. I don't have much left. Surface. Oh, he's right at the surface. Okay. Again? I'll keep him as far to the head. You go to the head and I'll go. Yeah. It'll okay. Mother's what? Oh, you're rolling him over? Uh, no, he's just upside down like that. Hook just popped out like nothing. Wow. That's a great part. Now, the best shot, well, one of the best parts is like, hold him by the tail. Yeah. yeah. It's working back. He's going to take off. Should I let him go? And as soon as you feel good about it, they've got some shots. Let him go. Nice one. Yeah, nice. That's a good way to end the day, eh? Ah, oh, that was First multi-stakeholder meetings were mostly perceptual problems. Those natives take all the fish. Those sporties are out there killing uh, unaccounted for fish. Those commercial fishermen come in and take all the fish away and don't benefit the community. Didn't that get and quite violent though it, at some it, well, We got into issues. There's a lot of conflict and there was a lot of name calling and a lot of rhetoric. But we found the more we met and we tried to keep some civility to it, we found there was more common issues. There used to be quite a bit of uh, animosity between probably the First Nations and the sports fishing and this type of thing, but the cooperation was really great to see in our community that they're all going in the same direction. This animosity, how did that rear its head? I think people just didn't understand what the history is all about. You know, when I went to school, you heard nothing about land claims or anything about First Nations rights and that, but it's all coming through now, so. We've had a difficult time over the past uh, 10 years agreeing on numbers. Back in the 80s, it was really confrontational. And uh, there was uh, actually about 258 charges uh, laid against the Sishok people at that time for... Uh, Your people? Yeah, by Department of Fisheries and Oceans. For what? Doing, for what? For, for exercising our right to fish. Yeah. You know, that was before we even had a quota or anything on the Sockeye. We've been selling fish since I was, since I was born. It's always happened. Last week on Thursday, they signed an agreement they can sell their sockeye. That's why there's totes and fish buyers up there buying the sockeye from all of these boats that are on the dock here. So for the first fishing. time ever, the Aboriginal fishers, well, the First Nation fishers, can sell their fish legally. 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 Uh, I've been fishing since I was 12. Yeah, on the boat? So. Yeah, my dad taught us how. It has been a thing that they've done their entire livelihood. Yeah. And uh, with it turning into a commercial fishery now and being recognized, I think it's nothing but bar one for the DFO. It's an economic gain for them. With an economic gain for the native population in town, it's, it's just a number one. And being able to make a living out of uh, something that's been a part of your sustenance all your life, uh, to me, uh, is nothing but fair. You bought 20,000 pounds of fish? Yeah, probably more. Cash? Yeah, 20,000 pounds. Yeah. So the cash is more than that. It's $1.50 a pound? Yeah. That's a lot of money to be handing out. You're well, a popular person. It was, yeah, it was, it was more than that yesterday. <laughs> it was, eh? <laughs> yeah. The local economy flourishes. All of that goes along with our fishery. And we've got a, an attitude of cooperation working fairly well. Um, the commercial seine industry still has a lot of clout, a lot of political clout. The sport guys, we definitely take our chunk, and the natives take their chunk, but I don't think we compare to a fleet of seiners or gill netters who are taking hundreds of thousands in a matter of days. I'll take 300 sockeye this July. That's a drop in the hat compared to one gill netter or a saner. I think they, they, they take easily, I would say, half. Half of, the, half allowable. of the allowable catch almost. And the one issue is, I forget the percentage, but a high percentage of the fleet is owned by one man. 
Jimmy Patterson from in Vancouver. He's uh, big time into, into the uh, commercial sane fleet. So it's a big corporation. It's a big corporation compared to the uh, little stuff like you have uh, mom and pop charter operations. They're coming with their big boats. They're taking half the allowable catch, mm -hmm. leaving with it. Mm -hmm. and, and what are they putting into the local economy? Well, not a whole heck of a lot. Let's put it that way. Uh, if if uh, how you can say, how can you say zero nicely? Yeah, okay, <laughs> you know, so they're not giving nothing. They're taking their equity back to Vancouver and that's where it's being dispersed there. Yeah, and this is a perfect example why the locals get really angry with the commercial fishing. When they book a trip with me, book a year in advance, and they're, that whole year they're very excited and can't wait. And you get out here and you just book your trip on the day after a commercial opening. And the saners have swept it clean. Yeah, you, now you've got a $600 boat ride. Because if, if there's a hundred boats right here and they decide to do a set, they'll just start running their net around you and you, it's up to you to get out of the way. Really? And if you don't get out of the way? You sold for eight bucks a pound. <laughs> <laughs> We're all in the same canoe in, in this town, in this valley, and uh, we believe in area-based management. Yeah. I think the community of Port Alberni, it's, they were tasked with, uh, with the management here. I think it would run a lot smoother. I, I think there's room for everybody to get along. It's just, it needs to be regulated properly. Same old story, I guess, eh? Cooperation, that's what it's all about. You don't want to see what happened in Scotland, where the wild salmon is gone. It was pretty sad when I was in Scotland a couple of years ago, and I went to see my cousin who had a smokehouse, and he actually was smoking a couple of fish. I said, where did the fish come from? They came from a fish farm in Norway. And I thought, pretty sad situation. We never want to get into that kind of situation. And this is the one thing that I'd like to see commercially become a viable thing too, stewards of your environment. And it's not just, it's just not kill. There has to be a rationality amongst it all too. But I want to be at the table because if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. What happened in the past, uh, we still got to remember it, but uh, we still have to move forward and make a better place for our children and such, eh? Scientists say that by 2050 and 40 years from now, the world fish stocks will have been depleted throughout the world. So we're really racing downhill in, in every respect. And yet, no one's doing anything because there's profits to be made, there's fish to be caught, there's people to be fed. But at some point, you know, we can't just allow each fish stock to collapse one after the other after the other, which is what we're doing now. And at the same time, I mean, they've been fishing perch on Lake Erie commercially for hundreds of years, and it's still going on, and it's, it's sustained. They are fishing walleye out of Lake Winnipeg, and that's been going on for, you know, 100 years, and it's, it's sustainable. It's managed. They, they regulate it. But it's local people who have a local interest in, in maintaining the local resource so that they can continue with their, their operation. So people, you know, who have to be accountable to their neighbors, to the people they live with, are more likely to do it right. It's, it's not the case when you have people who are in boardrooms who are only looking at the bottom line and the return on their uh, shareholders' investment. And, and I think that's the difference between the willpower to harvest and manage. I mean, manage is a very, I use that word very loosely, because how can you manage a wild resource? But at least we can harvest in a responsible way, as opposed to how it's happening now. Yeah, it's okay, Maestro. It's just me doing gardening. He sees the rod tip bent over, he gets all excited. When 
when you put your face in the mouth of the canyon, the murky water tides. What a relief to see all your sins absolved without a washing cloth, just the stillness of the night. Take me down to the water. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. That was a horrible thing to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh well. <laughs> Maestro, he's got a bad right knee. Des fois, c'est juste une retraite un peu comme Maestro, que le chien est rendu fatigué, puis c'est le temps de changer. Retire with me. Retire and become man's dog and just become a, a pet. Well, I'm going to spend here sort of a minimum of two weeks to bond. The trainers just want to make sure that the new dog is comfortable, that I'm doing everything right. They'll follow me. One of the trainers will follow me to, um, to back to Ottawa, and we'll spend another four or five days working in Ottawa. Where are Maestro? What? What? I see you a little bit, okay? All right. You be good now. You listen to Anne, okay? You listen to Anne. Be good. Let her take your four walks, all right? <laughs> 